Restoring Illinois to greatness. This is Illinois Rising, presented by the Illinois Policy Institute and hosted by AM560's Dan Proft. Dan Proft back with John Tillman, president of the Illinois Policy Institute. And uh, John, uh, we've got South Carolina coming up. Uh, Kind of... uh, earth-shattering events in terms of the performance of one Donald Trump and one Bernie Sanders in New Hampshire. And you had an interesting analysis of what you think happened in New Hampshire and how you think what happened in New Hampshire portends for South Carolina and the rest of the race. Uh, Give us your insights in that area. Let's talk about the Democrats first. What I think is so interesting with uh, um, Bernie Sanders, the people of New Hampshire were feeling the burn, as uh, as everyone likes to say. He got the 60%, 22 point win. I mean, you can take a shot of penicillin and that'll go away. (laughs) Yes. Uh, I think Hillary would like to give Bernie a shot, but I don't think there'd be penicillin in there. It might be hemlock, perhaps. Mm. Uh, But the thing that's interesting about what's going on in New Hampshire is he kills her, right? The other thing that's now emerged, of course, is that delegate-wise, they're about 50-50. Sort of interesting. He wins in a landslide and can't gain honor on delegates. Well, because of, super, of the super, super delegates, delegates, the six super delegates. Now, they could always flip for Sanders, but, I mean, it seems to me, as you head into New Hampshire, Bernie Sanders could make the argument, oh, the system is rigged for the powerful, yeah. for the insiders, and that's and they're rig- it's rigged against me, and it's rigged against you, and that's what we're collectively fighting against. I think that's exactly right. That feeds the narrative, which is the what I put in that U.S. News and World Report uh, piece that I wrote after the New Hampshire primary, is that both Trump and Sanders are mining the same vein of discontent, of angst and anger among the electorate. They both, both sides of the aisle, voters are very unhappy with the political establishment. They feel the game is rigged against them. They feel they're on the outside looking in. They feel the game is all about the insiders, the cronies, and everybody that's making deals, and they want to reject it. I think uh, Dan Henninger recently had a comment in the Wall Street Journal that the, the, the rejection of Hillary and the rise of Bernie is really a repudiation of Obama's seven years. This guy's been here for seven years. She's running as his heir apparent and continuation of the Obama, be the third term. And Bernie is ironically doing the best job of eviscerating the Obama legacy on the Democrat side. I think that's interesting. One of the things you said when we were recently at a Hawks game was that uh, Trump's uh, uh, support is inelastic. I thought that was a very good way to express it. Uh, What I put in the piece was that Trump, everybody used to, including me, used to talk about, you know, he's got an upside cap. And there still may be truth to that. But the point you made, which I think is really interesting that I uh, sort of stole and then expanded on in this piece, is that he has a floor below which he cannot go down below and uh, a fall rather. And then because there's still a big field where they're spreading out the remaining 65 percent, this is perfect for him. He can win as a plurality nominee state by state by state. So in order for this to change, uh, people are going to have to start attacking Trump and not Rubio and other sideshows. Well, right. But the problem is, of course, I mean, they're in a bit of a trick bag. This is a a prisoner's dilemma game. So it's Trump, then Cruz, Rubio, Kasich and Bush. And the best thing that happened for Trump, in addition to his win in New Hampshire, was John Kasich's second place finish because it keeps Kasich and Bush with a respectable Fourth place finish, I suppose. I mean, it's a ten percent for thirty-five million dollars. I don't know if that's respectable or votes. not. Yeah, that's it's a high price to pay, but I guess he's got the money. But I mean, it keeps them in certainly through South Carolina, probably through Super Tuesday. And if Trump continues to win states at his current polling level, most of the states, which is very similar to New Hampshire, I'm at thirty-five, and everybody else is under twenty. So they have to fight each other to get to second place, so they can focus on Trump because there's this free rider problem any of them have to go in together as a cartel to say, no, we're all going to train our sights on Trump. Well, why am I going to train my sights on Trump if I'm not going to benefit? Right. Well, see, I disagree with that now. I think the race has evolved to the point where rather than, which was what Christie did, right? He kills Rubio by eviscerating him in that uh, debate. And then it also killed Christie, which is ironic. Now, that that, that wasn't cause and effect, but it was a a little bit of a part of it. But, But Christie didn't come across... You know, he didn't present his vision. He didn't present what he stood for other than saying, this guy's not ready. I'm a governor. I'm ready. But no compelling case. Well, although Christie outperformed his polling going into the New Hampshire primary. Yeah, he went from uh, half a point to two points. Well, he went went from four to eight. I mean, as compared to Rubio after... Collapsing. After Iowa going from 17 to 10. But my, my point is, going back to the, the point about how you fight with each other to be the second place person, yeah. I think I think the race has changed now that among the, the also-rans who are between 10 and 16%, they should one of them will emerge by attacking Trump. In other words, now is the time to go after Trump. And what Henninger said, which I completely agree with, they need to go after him on policy chops, right. visionary policy chops, and dissect 
the weakness of Trump, that he has no substance, and endorse and buy into Trump's anger and angst. And the person best prepared to do both of those is Ted Cruz. Yeah, I think so, too. And the, he's best pre prepared to do that in, in a different way than the other candidates as well, because he has never really gone after Trump in a personal way. He hasn't attacked the persona. He's focused on the policy yes. difference. And I also think he's the most iconoclastic of the office holders or former office holders. And so he's seen as somebody who, if not Trump, a lot of Trump supporters would be willing to to uh, to align with Ted Cruz. Whereas for Marco Rubio, for Jeb Bush, certainly for John Kasich, certainly that is a much heavier lift. Yeah, he has, he can say with legitimacy, his bona fides, my Senate colleagues, the people in Washington, D.C., the political establishment, they hate me. They hate me so much. They're thinking of so the establishment is thinking of uh, supporting Trump. Now, I love Donald. I love what he's appealing to. Let me tell you why I'm the guy that the establishment really, you know, that you should all rally to because we both are anti-establishment. But let me tell you what I will do policy-wise that Donald doesn't even know how to discuss or debate me on. Well, right. And here's the opportunity really only that it only exists for Trump and for Cruz because the others are unwilling to really go after their colleagues to go after the GOP-controlled Congress in the way that Cruz and Trump will do. Obama's last budget. Right. Obama's last budget. This is why why has debt more than doubled under President Obama? And he, he continues to pile on more taxes and more regulations and more profligate spending, as is exemplified in the last budget he just presented. It's not just because of President Obama. It's because of this go along Republican Congress that if I'm Ted Cruz, I have stood athwart telling Mitch McConnell he's a liar. Nobody else is willing to do that. And for Donald Trump, it's, you know, they're all part of the problem, Ted Cruz included, because they're all members of Congress. So those two are uniquely positioned to continue this line of attack that a good percentage of Republican primary voters ascribe to. Absolutely. I think what I haven't actually heard that argument made. And I think it's a very good one because the other argument you get uh, opposite that is, well, he's going to be if Cruz becomes president, he can't get along with uh, the Republican majorities in the House and the Senate. Things have a funny way of changing when you have the bully pulpit yeah. of the presidency. Yeah, the bully pulpit and the associated Power, Power the, and money the, and all the rest. The pen and the phone, as a president <laughs> once said.